I believe all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that I may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Therefore, I believe in Him who was sent, the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe He died on the cross for my sin, arose three days later, and set the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Therefore, I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am a new creation. I have been justified. I am being sanctified. I will be glorified. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, prepare my heart and open eyes of my understanding that I'm going to receive your word. Give me ears to hear what your spirit has to say. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, Keith thought we had to have some music, so he brought out his Baptist hymnal. You know, we, we had a great uh, singer with chord and, and guitar player and all those things, and he's gone to work for the nation of Israel, uh, for the minister of tourism, and so he's moved off to Atlanta, Georgia, and, and so we missed that gift. But you got to remember, God's Word says where two or more get together in my name, I'm in your midst. He doesn't say if you got somebody that sings pretty and can and you listen to singing and all those things. He says, where two or more get together, then I'm in your midst. So we're getting together in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for coming. I hear from the Lord every year as I speak and, and, and I mean as I pray and I seek him. And, and the word that God gave me for this year is to rewind. And so when you look at rewind, there's two parts of rewinding. Number one, introspectively, you got to look inward. And you got to examine things in your life and look at things going on around about you. And number two is retrospectively. You look back behind and see what's taken place. Sadie and I held our first public meetings in Jacksburg, Texas 28 years ago. January the 25th was the 28th anniversary of that. Before that, we held Bible studies in our home constantly. And, and as we began those meetings, I prayed and I said, Lord, if we're going to keep meeting, what is it that you want me to, to be about? I need a mission statement. And so as we rewind and we look back, I've looked back on 28 years and I look what the basic mission statement of Christian mission was of what God gave me. And there was a five-step process that he gave me. It was very simple, five words. Number one was to elevate the name of Jesus. Number two was to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Number three was to evangelize the lost. Number four was to edify one another. And number five was to endure to the end. I had scriptures for each and every one of them and I could show you and go back and I could look over every one of them and show you what it was about. And so I did an overall teaching. This will be the fourth week of a series that I'm teaching on those five steps. I did an overall view of it the first Sunday, then, then I did the, the first one on elevate the name of Jesus. Why elevate the name of Jesus? Well, you read John chapter 3, everybody has memorized John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever shall believe on Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, if you go on and you read the whole chapter, you'll see in that chapter that it says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So Jesus was lifted up on a cross. He was elevated on that cross. And y'all, He didn't die for sin just for sin. He became sin. And you need to understand that. You need to comprehend that. That why do we elevate the name of Jesus? Because He became sin. He took every sin and He became that sin. For the first time in Jesus' life, He did not have that fellowship with the Father. God created you and I for fellowship with Him. And for rulership, relationship and rulership. And Jesus had been with the Father, and He and the Father were one, and then all of a sudden, Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why He was forsaken is because God could not look upon sin. God is a holy God. And so therefore, Jesus took all the sin and became sin, and so therefore, God had to turn His back upon that. And that's why Jesus cried out. And so why do we exalt Him? 
Why do we praise Him? Why do we extol Him? Why do we magnify the name of Jesus? Because at the name of Jesus, every name name must bow. So we are coming together and we are going to elevate the name of Jesus. We're going to have a new perspective. We're going to have a, a, a new identity about us. We're going to have a new position because we're seated in heavenly places with Him. So then we go to number two, and number two is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You, feed, you read in Ephesians chapter 4, and it says, Jesus Himself gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. And so if, if you ask me what my job is, I'll tell you my job is to equip you for the work of ministry. That's what God has called me to do. And so if we're going to elevate the name of Jesus and then equip the saints, then we are going to educate you and teach you about who you are in Christ, but we're going to ultimately teach you who Christ is in you. And you're going to find out that as you equip the saints for the work of ministry, then number three comes easy. Number three is to evangelize the lost. When I was growing up, I took classes on, on how to lead people to the Lord. I studied on the Roman road. I studied all the scriptures, John 3, 16. I've already quoted it. For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then you go to Romans 3, 23, and it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And then we find out in Romans 5, He says that, that even when you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And so you follow all those things. And, and, and I believe that I discovered that the church of the living God makes evangelism difficult. I believe that they make witnessing to other people difficult. I discovered that evangelism is easy when you do number one and number two. When you continually elevate the name of Jesus, He becomes your identity. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 and Jesus said... Father, I pray that my disciples, those 12 disciples, that they may be one as you and I are one. And then he said, I don't just pray for them, but I pray for everyone that is going to come after them, that they may be one as you and I are one. When you come to the realization that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you when you receive Jesus. When you discover and you realize that Jesus lives within you when you discover that God the Father and Jesus are one and so therefore you are one with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so you are one with Him. You are in unity with Him. And so if you will come to that full saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, He says, I don't want any to perish. I want all to come to that saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. I want all to come to repentance. When Jesus died upon the cross, when He became sin. He died for all of mankind. It left no one out. But all of mankind has not received Him. All of mankind have not received that salvation. But if I do number one, elevate the name of Jesus. If I do number two to educate you of who Christ is in you, that you are one with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that you can walk as He walked, you can talk as He talked. How can you do that? Well, you need to dig into the Word of God and understand that if you don't put the Word in, the Word can't come out. When Jesus was confronted by Satan, Jesus, the first words He said to Satan was, It is written. It is written. And that's how He defeated Satan, is through the Word. He overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the Word of His testimony. And He loved not His life unto death. That's how you and I are going to overcome. So I believe that we have neglected equipping the saints. We have neglected the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. When we bring all five of them in, Paul says one plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. He says neither one is anything. It's all about Him. So number one is about Jesus. Equipping the saints is about receiving Jesus' gift to the church. And number Three, evangelism. Did you know that a person can't even come unless the Holy Spirit draws them? You worry about going and witnessing. When Sadie and I went back on, out on the rodeo circuit a long time ago, 
37 years ago. When we went out on the road, I thought, oh God, if you're going to let me go out here, if you're going to let me do this, I got to preach to somebody, I got to lay hands on somebody, I got to witness to somebody. Y'all, I drove more people away than I ever brought to the Lord. Because why? Because religion stinks. Religion is man's attempt at gaining God's approval. Religion is man's attempt at doing what they think God wants them to do. It's not about being a son of the Most High God. It's not about being a daughter of the Most High God. That's what the message of the kingdom is about. Is that when you receive Jesus, you are a part of a new kingdom. You are a new creation. Old things are passed away. You have a new identity. You have a new position. You have a new perspective. Because you see the kingdom of God. Then you enter the kingdom of God. When you're walking in the kingdom of God, then as you're walking along, the Holy Spirit will whisper to you and say, hey, that person is hurting right over there. Why don't you go over there and say hello to that person ask them if they're okay? Why don't you just ask them if you can pray for them? Oh, no, I can't do that. That's what we pay the preacher for. That's religion, though. That's religion. If you believe number one and number two, then you've got to understand that you are God's ambassador. He has sent you out into the world. And an ambassador is a representative for the king. The ambassador is a representative for the sovereign ruler. You and I have been called ambassadors for Christ. And so therefore, we're to go out into all the world. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 16, if you got your Bibles with you, Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority was given to Jesus? All authority. When Satan came in the garden and deceived Eve, and Adam ate along there with her, Satan usurped the authority of God that God gave to man. Genesis 1.26, man, you have dominion over all the earth. Satan came in and he stole that dominion. So now Jesus is saying, I just defeated sin. I just defeated death. I became sin. I was buried in the grave. I rose from the dead. This is the last words that Jesus says to his disciples before he went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority is that, y'all? It's all. And Jesus said to his disciples, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe how many things? All things that I have commanded you. Do you know what Jesus' command was? Jesus said, believe in Jesus, believe in me, and love one another. That was Jesus' command. He said, you'll be known as my disciples because you have love for one another. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How long will he be with us? Always. Why? Because you're one with him. You're one with God the Father, one with God the Son, and one with God the Holy Spirit. As he is, so are you in this world. You have an anointing from the Holy One to know all things. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ. And so if you begin to understand these things and you're educated, and then we empower you to understand that the Holy Spirit of God is within you. And the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you. God the Father speaks to God the Son that's sitting in the gap for you and I. And God the Son speaks to God the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only go where the Father tells me to go. I only say what the Father tells me to say. And so God the Father tells Jesus, Jesus tells the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and I. Oh, wow. This is getting deep in here. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and another's voice they will not follow. Jesus speaks to the Holy Spirit, and he speaks to you. 
and he tells you to go in all the world. But I believe in institutionalized church. I believe in the commercialized church. We have told people to come to us. Come to us. Pay us and we'll put on a pretty show for you. Then you go back and you live like hell. You come back next week and we'll do it again. But see, Jesus said, go in all the world and make disciples. So why is number three so important? Because if you begin to read your Bible and you begin to go through Scripture, you'll find throughout the Bible, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, To the weak I become weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. Did you know I've had ministers stand before me and said, I'll have you know I've been in ministry 30 years and I discovered I can't be all things to all men. So no, I don't want to have fellowship with you. They do not know. They do not see the kingdom of God. They do not enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're told they seek after one to save them and make them a worse hypocrite than themselves. That's scripture, y'all. And so he's told us to go and win souls. Matthew 4, 19, he says, And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Mark 1, 17, And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Daniel 12, 3 says, Those who are wise shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forevermore. If you would let your light shine, and they see Jesus in you, and the Holy Spirit is drawing them, they'll come over to you and they'll say, Hey, I need to learn more about this Jesus you're talking about. Hey, I, I, I want to know about that salvation stuff. Hey, I want to know about how you be born again. In John 3, Jesus told a very religious man, he said, you know all the law, but he said, unless you be born again, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. And he said, how? How can I do that? And he said, you must be born of water and of spirit. See, when you're born again, you're spirit man. You're made up of physical body, you're made up of a spirit, and you're made up of a soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you trust Christ, your spirit is what is born again. And the Bible says that you're born again of incorruptible seed. Do you know what incorruptible means? It means your spirit can't be corrupted. Your flesh can be corrupted, and your soul can be corrupted. Your eyes are the wind of the soul. So how can you be corrupted? By what you look upon but what you listen to. And so if we study and we look, Jesus told them, you, you're going to be fishers of men. In Luke 5, 10, Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. James 5, 20 said, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Jude 1, 23 says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Matthew 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. John 4, 35, do not stay. There are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. The harvest is white. Romans 10 says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. Paul was talking about the Jews and he talked about in Romans 9, he says, my kinsmen, and in, in Romans 11, he talked about his fellow countrymen that he desired to see them come to salvation. 1 Peter 2, 21, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Mark 16, verse 15, Mark wrote the great commission that Matthew wrote that I told you out of Matthew 28, and he said to them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature did you know at times to preach the gospel you have to use words but did you know that 99.9% .9 of the time you don't ever open your mouth you never open your mouth 
God began to teach this to Sadie and I 37 years ago. Sadie and I had just got married, and I guess it was, it was 36 years ago because it was the second year of our marriage. We are out on the rodeo circuit, and we were in Houston, Texas. Sadie was five months pregnant. We were expecting our first child. We're excited about it, and I'm competing at Houston, the biggest rodeo in the world, and, and I got out there, and I, I didn't do any good. And Sadie got up one morning, and she said, Eugene, i got to go see a doctor. I'm having problems. And so we took her to the doctor, and, and the doctor checked her out, and he said, I'm sorry, your baby died. And he said, I must do a procedure because she could bleed to death. The first thoughts I had was, no, no. God, your word says, blessed is a full womb. And I started screaming and crying, and I was having a pity party, y'all, to be the truthfully to you. And when I finally shut my mouth, and slowed my mind down, I heard the still small voice of the Father. As Jesus was in the garden, he cried out to God, and he said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass before me. But not my will be done, but your will be done. And I said, okay, Father. Apparently something's wrong, and, and so apparently this is your will at this time. And so... I pray that your will be done, but not my will be done. Went back the next morning, doctor did another sonogram, and he, he said, I'm sorry. And then Sadie and I loaded up, and that's a long testimony, and, and some of you have heard it, but God provided for everything. And we went back to Oklahoma where we were living. And I sat down at my desk, and I said, Lord, I'm not walking out of this house except to feed the horses, and I'm going to seek your face. Because you said, if I'd seek you with all my heart and all my soul, I'd find you. And so I began a fast. I stopped eating, and all I did was prayed and read my Bible. And I did this one day, two days, three days, nothing. I heard nothing. On the fourth day, when I woke up and I started to read my Bible, let me see if I can pull it up here. Second Timothy. I opened my Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as I began to read, the words began to jump off the pages at me. And the words said, I charge you therefore for God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead in His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But you, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Did you know there's people trying to make God a uh, non-binary God right now, religions? Did you know there are religions right now, traditional religions that are saying that uh, Jesus, the gospel of Jesus is no longer our focus, but uh, social justice is our focus? And they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The words jumped off the pages and I realized that God was saying, this is what I've called you to do at this time. Get back on the road, endure the afflictions, endure the, the sufferings. Why? Because God says, all the pressures of life, all the afflictions are many of the righteous, but God delivers us out of them all. And so I told Sadie we were going to go back on the road, and our first rodeo we rented in Monroe, Louisiana. So Sadie and I drove all the way to Monroe, got to Monroe, and it was a Coliseum rodeo in the middle of the winter. And as we go into that Coliseum, the Coliseum was, was a basketball gym, and so it had concrete walls all the way around it, and the bleachers were up above that concrete wall. And we competed down there on that stadium. I walked into the arena, I got Sadie seated up in the stands, and I walked in the arena, and as I was walking down the wall of the arena, that concrete wall, that center block wall, I was walking down it, and as I started walking down it, this, this big horse that was trying, this stud horse that was trying to get out of the arena, he come around by me, and when he did, I got up against the wall, and he jumped, and he kicked, and he kicked me right on the outside of the knee. And it sounded like a shotgun went off, and I felt my leg break. I'm going through some afflictions because we just lost our child. 
And now all of a sudden I just broke my leg. Lord, this is a little too much right now. And I lean up against the wall and I'm saying, Lord, I need help. And all the other cowboys, all the bulldoggers are walking back to the back end just like I was. And as they walk by, they're looking at me and they're laughing. Guys are riding by and they're looking and they're laughing. And all of a sudden I realized, God, I hate these guys. These are a bunch of jerks. Why don't you just go ahead and take them out and get them over with? And all of a sudden I realized, Lord, you've called me out here to win these guys to you. And you're showing me that this is about me. It's not about you. And I said, Father, forgive me. And I got to where I could move, and I, I eased back to the back end of where the bulldogging was fixing to take place. And, and as I got there uh, limping up, I, one of the biggest men on the rodeo circuit from Wyoming was standing there. And as I come limping by, and I said, hey, Charlie, how are you? He looked at me, and he said, man, my knee's killing me. And I said, see, Lord, see how big of jerks they are? And I guess he saw and heard me talking to the Lord. And he said, no, really, I hurt my knee practicing. I, I don't even know if I can bulldog in the morning. I'm up in the slack in the morning. I don't know if I can even bulldog. Y'all, I'm in the midst of suffering. I'm in the midst of hurting. And I just laid my hand upon his big shoulder, and I said, Lord, heal him. Move in his life. And I walked off. Satan and I went back to the motel, and, and I was praying and crying out to God, Why? Why, God, why? And all of a sudden, I heard that still, small voice, and I heard myself praying at a service in Oklahoma just like this before I preached. And I said, Father, I don't want to be what Eugene wants to be anymore. Break me and mold me in what you want me to be. And I heard this old, still, small voice of the Lord say, Eugene, that's an effectual, fervent prayer. I'm answering that prayer. And I said, okay, Lord, what do I do now? And I heard very plainly the Lord said, pray for Charlie Patterson's service, uh, salvation. And so I began to pray for Charlie's salvation. And then I heard him say, thank me for Charlie's salvation. And I began to thank him for Charlie's salvation. And I spent the night speaking God's word over Charlie. The next morning I told Sadie I was going to go back to the Coliseum. God healed my knee, y'all. I had a cowboy preacher that I knew that was there, and he came and prayed for me, and God healed my knee. And so I walked back up to the Coliseum that next morning as I went through the, the, the alleyways and getting up into the stadium. The first person that I saw was Charlie. And I said, hey, Charlie, how are you? And he looked around, and he said, Eugene, my knee don't hurt no more. Will you tell me more about Jesus? Will you tell me more about salvation and so I sat in the stands in Monroe, Louisiana and I just shared the simplicity of the gospel that God loved this young man and that God had forgiven him of all of his sins and all he had to do was call upon the name of the Lord because he said all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved God desires for all to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus he desires for none to perish read 1 Timothy Chapter 2, read Titus chapter 2, 11. And he says, grace has get, been a ransom for all. It's appeared to all. 2 Peter 3, 9 says he's not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so God began to teach me and began to show me. Evangelism is easy when you do three things. So if you got your note takers, your pen and your paper, if you got your thumbs loosen up, here's the three points I want you to see. Number one, you got to settle permanently within yourself. You are not your own. You are not your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 20, he says, What do you not know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. You are bought at a price. You are not your own. Jesus paid the price. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All deserve death. But Jesus became that death. He became that sin and he died for you. And he desires for you to come to that saving knowledge. And all you have to do 
is call upon the name of the Lord. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Philippians chapter 2. I could go on, y'all, for a long time. I'm going to try not to do that. <coughs> One of y'all young guys, bring me a bottle of water, please. Thank you very much. Or an old guy. I don't care if it's a woman. Bring me a water, please. <laughs> In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he's less. he says, thank you, young man. He had a birthday this week. We weren't going to talk about mine, though. He says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. When the Lord told me, endure affliction. You know, going through the toughest time that Sadie and I had been in life, of losing a child, getting kicked by the horse. You know, it's, it's not fun to stay up all night praying for somebody else. You'd rather lay down and, and lick your wounds and go to sleep. But see, when we don't think as highly of ourselves and we think more highly of others, then we're understanding to settle permanently within us. You're not your own. Let this, man, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross that at the name of Jesus every name should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. So I've got to settle permanently. It's not about me. I've been bought and paid for. And I'm to think about others. Number two, submit to God's righteousness. In Romans chapter 3 it says, They being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. To submit to the righteousness of God, to submit to God's righteousness, you've got to understand that when God looks at you, He sees Jesus in you. It's not about how late you stayed up praying for somebody. It's not about how long you preached, how long you did whatever it was you did. It's not about how many church services you attend, in, attend during the week, how many messages you listen to. It's not about how much money you give. It's about you submitting the righteousness of God. And that righteousness of God says that your righteousness is filthy rags. You're not saved by your good works. Your good works show that you're saved. And so you need to understand but you've got to submit to God's righteousness. When God sees Eugene, he sees Christ in me. And so therefore, he sees that I am righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 through 21. I guess if I get to 2 Corinthians, I was in 1st and it didn't have a 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 12, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. It's a hard issue, y'all. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we have a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, how many did Jesus die for? Then he says all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. 
Yet now we know him thus no longer. Whenever I was leaning up against that wall with my leg broke and all the cowboys laughing at me because look at the preacher. God didn't help him none on that deal, did he? And I was looking at them in the flesh and thinking about how big the jerks they were. But then God began to show me that I was not to see them in the flesh. I was to see that they were going to die and go to hell if they did not receive Christ. And I needed to be a witness to those guys by the way that I lived. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us. How many of y'all are us's? Some of y'all ain't convinced. And He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. That means He was not counting their sins against them. Why? Because Jesus became sin and is committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Number one, settle permanently. You're not your own. Number two, submit to God's righteousness. We are righteous because of Christ. We have become the righteousness of God in Him. And He's given you and I the ministry of reconciliation. So what does that mean? It means each and every one of us. We are to share Jesus with those people. And it has nothing to do with your words. It has to do all with your actions. Because your actions speak a lot louder than your words. Number three. You must surrender to God's will. In John chapter 6 verse 38. Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 through 7. Therefore I exhort you, first of all, that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I exhort you first that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks be made to all men. How many people are we pray for? For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For thus it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved. That is mankind, men and women, who desires all to be saved. How many does He want to be saved? To come to the knowledge of the truth. For as there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for how many? To be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. God desires for all to come to the saving knowledge. I've already shared the, the Titus chapter 2, verse 11. He says that grace that was given and it's appeared to all mankind that leads to salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9, he says he desires and not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so what I've discovered about evangelism, and he talks about it in this text, and he talks about priests, and he talks about being a priest. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'll close with this one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Coming to Him, as a living stone, rejected indeed by man, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, 
a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own people. Special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Those of you that he, he, he says over in here that we are to be priests. We're a priesthood of believers. You study the book of Revelations. He's called us kings and priests before our God. And we understand in the Old Testament the priests did two things. The priest was the mediator between man and God. The priest is the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies that represented God's presence. The priest was the only one that offered those sacrifices. So the the priest was a person who mediated, who stood in the gap. In Exodus chapter 22 verse 30, it says that he sought for a man to stand in the gap, to make a wall and stand in the gap before those on behalf of the land so that I shall not destroy it. And he said, but I found none. That one scripture has changed my life because God says I'm calling to my sons and daughters to stand in the gap. Jesus went and sat down at the right hand of the Father and He said, now you go. And you and I are to go into all the world and we're to make disciples. And how do we make disciples? Because whatever we choose to do in word and deed, we do it as unto the Lord rather than a man. And if we look at the priesthood, and you and I are supposed to be priests, and he tells us that we're all for the sacrifice, the praise. The priest, he says, we're to a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says on down here that we are a living stones, and we're being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable God through Jesus. Simplicity, what does this mean? You ask me to pray for somebody for their salvation. And I pray, God, your word says, for two or more agree on anything is touching heaven, it shall be done. So Sadie and I are praying in agreement right now for Billy Bob. Father, you said you desire for none to perish, but all to come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Father, your word says that perhaps you will grant repentance that they may know the truth, come to their senses, and escape the snare of the evil one. So, Father, we lift Billy Bob before you, and we ask that you deliver him from the snare of the enemy. We ask that you grant him repentance that he may know the truth, come to that full saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Father, I remind you it's your will for none to perish. So, Father, I ask that you set Billy Bob up. I ask that you set those divine appointments, those ordained, appointed by you. Father, your Holy Spirit begin to move upon his heart that you begin to draw him. Father, I pray that he will have a divine appointment with you, that someone will walk in worthy of you. They'll walk as you walk. They'll talk as you talk. And Father, they'll represent Christ to Billy Bob. Father, I remind you of your word. That you said we're to believe. You said if I pray believing, I shall receive. So Father, I believe for Billy Bob's salvation. So therefore, I've prayed for it. And now I'm going to praise you and I'm going to thank you for it right now. Does this work? I was crying out to God. My sister and brother-in-law have moved here. They're, not, they're, they're visiting their, their sons and grandchildren today. She had three boys, and when I was playing college football, I used to go every weekend to see them because it was too far for me to come to Jack County, but I could go to where they lived in the Panhandle. And those little boys, I played with them, I loved them, and I started crying out to God for their salvation. I started praying that God would bring them to that saving knowledge, and I kept crying out, God, save them. God, I pray for you to save them. And then one day God said, Eugene, you ever thought about thanking me for their salvation? And I said, wow, God, they didn't teach me that. He said, begin to praise me and thank me for their salvation. I began to praise him and thank him for their salvation. 
The next week, my sister called me and she said, Eugene, you're not going to believe what happened Sunday. I took the boys to Sunday school and then they came in and sat down and I don't know what went on in there, but we were waiting to get started with, with our church service. The band was up there and, and one of the boys asked me, Mommy, what happens if I don't accept Jesus? What will happen to me if I don't receive him? And she gulped and she said, well, the Bible says that we'll go to hell if we don't accept Christ. And tears started running down his eyes. And she said, oh God, what do I do now? I said, I hope you jumped up and ran to the front and y'all had a revival that broke out because a little boy. She said, no, that was the longest church service I've ever sat through in my whole life. See? The religion of man says you can't cut, jump up and run and interfere. You can't jump up and stop the music, the band playing. You can't stop the preacher and say, this little boy is ready now. The field is white for harvest. It's prepared. All you got to do is pray and then begin to praise. The key to all victory is praying and then praising the Lord. Well, the preacher, at the service was over, she took him down. Well, we got to wait till the invitation. You know, we got to. So they went down at the invitation. And he accepted Christ, and the preacher came over to talk to him. And while he was there, he started talking to the older boy, too. This was the middle boy. And so both of them accepted the Lord the same day. And they said the little one was too young. Oh, but I don't think so. The Lord spoke to me. He said, Eugene, I wanted their mother and dad to be a part of this. That's why I didn't want you to share with them. That's why I didn't want you to force the issue. Some of you are trying to force the issue. Stop trying to force the issue. God's big enough to save your child, your mama, your dad, your grandpa, whoever it is. God's big enough. And you pray for them. And then you learn what God's Word says and you start speaking God's Word. And so I continued to thank the Lord for the salvation of the youngest boy. And the next time they came to my mom and dad's house, I was sitting downstairs watching ball games or whatever with everybody. And very plainly, I heard that still small voice say, Eugene, I'm going to allow you. I'm going to allow you to speak to the baby. And he was upstairs, so I walked upstairs all by myself, and it's just me and him. And I said, can I talk to you a minute? And he said, yes, sir. And I said, I just want to tell you, Jesus loves you. And he loves you so much. And tears just started pouring out of his eyes. And I said, would you like to know Jesus that I know? He said, yes, sir. And I just led that boy into a simple prayer. Father, I confess that I've disobeyed you. And I confess that I need a Savior. And I believe Jesus is that Savior. Jesus, will you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? God is so good, y'all. And so if we'll take care of number one, to elevate the name of Jesus, to exalt Him and praise Him, to magnify His name, to extol Him. As we begin to get His perception of things and we begin to positionally understand that we walk in the kingdom of God here on earth, it's not about getting to heaven, about when we fly away. It's about today, to now, receiving that love today. We've got to equip each and every one of the persons that call themselves Christians, that call themselves disciples. We've got to educate them on the Word of God. and We've got to empower them, telling them, you're to be filled with the Holy Spirit continually, every day. You're to be filled with the Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, guide me today into all truth. And then we're to evangelize our world. 
We're not to sit in a building that has a steeple on it every Sunday and say, oh, well, we're going to fly away one day. We're to go into that world and we're to evangelize the lost. And at times we even open our mouths and say words. But 99% of the time, it's how you lead your life. Amen. Amen. Father, we praise you and we thank you. And Father, anyone sitting here today, anybody listening today, that has not truly received you as Savior, Father, I just ask that you draw upon them right now, Holy Spirit. I ask that you grant them repentance to know the truth. Father, you desire that they be saved. Your word states it very plainly. You said you desire for none of them to perish, but them to come to repentance. And all that means is to change their mind. I'm going to stop doing it my way, and I'm going to follow Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, come and be Lord of their life. Come and reveal yourself as Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've asked John Barry if he will come and take communion with us this morning, and then we will be done. Once again, thank you all so much for being here. And I want to I wanna help you understand. If you take care of number one and number two, elevating the name of Jesus and equipping the saints, evangelism is not difficult. Evangelism is easy. Good morning. Thank you guys for joining me. And Eugene, thank you for asking me for this opportunity. Eugene asked me to lead communion today, and he, as he was discussing it with me, he asked me to, to share what communion means to me. So I wanted to share a little bit with you guys. Um, I think the history of communion is really powerful, and I think a lot of people overlook that this is really a celebration, and it has its roots in celebration. In fact, if you look, the first communion really revolves around the Passover feast, and it was the Passover feast which was a celebration of God supplying the needs to the nation of Israel and celebrating how they were relieved and as they wandered the desert for 40 years. And it was that Passover celebration that celebrated Israel's relief from the bondage of Egypt. But we're also celebrating today, we're celebrating the freedom that we have from the bondage of sin because of Jesus' death for us. And while death is sad and we know that he suffered, we also celebrate that, that freedom that he's given us from that, and that's what this recognizes um, it's really recognized, if you look, when Jesus is in Capernaum, and he's in the synagogue in Capernaum, and he's talking to a bunch of the leaders of Israel, in John 6, verse, uh, verses 53, when Jesus is talking, he says right in there, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. He says, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on this, Jesus, I will, will live forever. So as we celebrate and we recognize that we have the opportunity to live forever because of Jesus' sacrifice, that's what this represents today. Because for over 400 years, the nation of Israel celebrated Passover. And now for over 2,000 years, Christians all over the world celebrate with this sacrifice that we remember today. And so I, I think it's amazing that I get to do this with what my grandparents did, that my parents and my great-grandparents did. And now we get to do this and set an example for our children as well. So if you guys would please join me. Let's celebrate this because for what, what communion really means to me is that I believe in Jesus, that I desire him to be in my life, and that I'm grateful for his grace. So join me. Let's, uh, Luke 22, I think, has one of the most beautiful versions of communion. And on Luke 22, 19, bear with me. And it says, and he took bread, he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
as we move forward, it says, And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So let's take this celebration, let's go forward, and let's praise and represent God's love to everyone we encounter this week. Thank you. To partner with us financially or support our ministry, text the code KINGDOMLIFE to 94000 or visit our website, cmjacksboro.com.